Welcome back to the Pilgrim Faith Podcast, where human wonder fuels the quest for Christian wisdom. Today, Dale and I are joined by our good friends, Dr. Corey Brock and Dr. Nathaniel Gray Sutanto. Uh, once again, I think both of you were here with me uh, uh, just about a year ago to talk about uh, all things related Bavink. And of course, uh, uh, that's what we're going to do again today, just to to reintroduce our guest, though, uh, uh, Nathaniel Gray Sutanto is a professor of systematic theology at Reformed Theological Seminary in Washington, D.C., my alma mater. Uh, so a good place. It's a good seminary still. I'm, I'm sure it's still a good place now that with Gray there, it's a, it's a good addition. Uh, and Corey Brock is uh, assistant pastor, is that right, of First Pres in Jackson, Mississippi, but uh, both graduated from University of Edinburgh, uh, writing a dissertation on Herman Bovink. And I think actually maybe uh, uh, this, had, this had maybe just fresh come out last time we talked. Uh, you had already published, I think last time we talked, uh, Herman Bovink's Philosophy of Revelation, uh, which, which you both uh, edited in its new edition. But uh, this little volume, Christian Worldview, uh, you not only edited, but along with uh, Dr. Eglinton, you also translated. Uh, and so this is just a, has, is a remarkable little read, and maybe what we can do uh, just, and that's really what we want to talk today about, is, is sort of center our conversation around Bobbing's Christian worldview. Uh, maybe the first thing we can do is just uh, talk about how the two books are related. Why, why translate Christian worldview? Obviously, philosophy of Revelation, I guess, was one of these texts that one of the rare Bobbing texts that was published in English very, very early. Uh, 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 after he delivered these, well, because he delivered them, uh, you know, uh, the Stone Lectures, he delivered them at Princeton. Uh, whereas this, of course, it's a related book, but it was written in Dutch and, and is not translated in English, and, well, until now. Uh, and so maybe maybe talk to us about why, why publishing this book uh, and how is it related to philosophy of Revelation? Sure, yeah, thanks. Thanks for having us. Great to be back. Um, oh, our pleasure. So... Uh, Bavink wrote the le th these were originally lectures Christian worldview he wrote them in late 1903 and delivers them in 1904 and then they're published as a book in 1904 uh, the book sold out very quickly it was very popular um, and Bavink immediately saw Christian worldview as a short distillation a prequel if you will of a much bigger project and that much bigger project would be his 10 lectures he wrote for philosophy of revelation uh, the stone lectures as you mentioned and those are delivered in 1908 in, in princeton and in a couple other places as well and then they're published in 1909 in germany in german in english and in, in dutch in the netherlands uh they um they decided because of the su success of christian worldview to republish it in 1913 and then again in 1927, and he did tweak it in 1913. And so what we have here, the English reader has in front of them now, is the 1913 edition mm. of Christian Worldview that included Bobbing's, um, some additions, not a massive amount, but some improvements and additions. So he came back around to Christian Worldview after Philosophy of Revelation. Mm. And, uh, you know, I'll just say something very brief about Philosophy of Revelation. Gray, you can add to it whatever you want. Um, but Christian worldview and philosophy of revelation are, are very similar projects. I mean, philosophy of revelation, um, to, to put it, it's a, it's a detailed and complicated book in many ways, but to put it in brief, I would say it's a detailed examination of how God's condescension in his revelation and his coming out of his hiddenness is revealing of himself is actually, on the one hand, the ontological justification for reality and fits reality uh, that Christian Christianity, and particularly a theology of revelation, makes most sense and fits best with reality as it presents itself to us. That's kind of the underlying idea, I would say, in philosophy of revelation. And so then he's going through all these domains of reality the sciences, the arts, religion itself, aspects of the human intellect and aspects of the human heart that we all know in these various domains and explaining how Christianity best fits with the reality that we see presenting itself to us in the subjective and objective dimensions of each of those domains. Yes. 
Yeah. Mm. Yeah, and I think you guys even and you guys even mentioned that um, in the introduction of this book, how uh, sort of like worldview is like the unification of the subjective and the objective. When those things come into harmony with one another, and they perfectly align and make sense of all the other parts, that is sort of Christian worldview. But yeah, great. Go ahead, brother. No, yeah, that's exactly right, Corey. Thanks so much for highlighting all those things. And I think we we wanted to translate Christian worldview. Uh, as well, because I think what we miss sometimes about Bavink is that we just locate him as Kuiper's theologian, because we have primarily in reference, you know, his reform dogmatics, which was published before some of these other public theological works mm -hmm. that he's doing in his Amsterdam years, right? So I think after he's finished with his first edition of the reform dogmatics, he really did turn to thinking about applied theology. Maybe we can think about it that way. How does theology implicate not only, you know, our, our, our ecclesial confession, but also the way in which we think about the, the other domains of public life. So Christian worldview was actually published in the same year as another work that hasn't been translated yet, but Lord willing, we'll get to it, uh, is uh, another word called Christian science. And it's, it's a hard word to translate into English, maybe Christian scholarship or Christian higher education, Christian higher critical inquiry, whatever it might be. And in that particular work as a kind of companion work to Christian worldview, he basically explores how Christianity would reshape the university. What are the benefits of Christianity for the making of the university? And how does Christianity therefore implicate the natural sciences and so on? So uh, these two works really do set up as a prequel launching pad for philosophy of revelation. And then even beyond philosophy of revelation, he treated works like, you know, the place of woman in contemporary society. So he really did turn in his Amsterdam years to these public theological issues. Mm. Yeah. yeah. And that does seem to be the voice, the, the rhetorical voice of Christian worldview is you get this sense. Um, uh, and I think we've maybe in our last conversation, we talked about this as well. You get this even in, in the sense between, uh, I gather, between maybe the first and second edition of the dogmatics. And Eglinton's biography has shown this for sure, that you get you you feel this turn from sort of an eyeball on the church to an eyeball to just toward sort of mankind as such, and so even in the dogmatics, you get this kind of expanded vantage point that's trying to kind of integrate sort of sort of a whole globe of people <laughs> into this public project, which is Christian theology in some way that's for man. And when you read this book, it seems like part of what he's trying to argue is that Christianity is uh, has something to say that's universal in a particular sort of way, that this is right. actually something that is graspable uh, in very public terms in, in, in some sense uh, by, by human beings. But maybe maybe one way of just kind of getting into the actual, you know, you know, you know, substance of the work itself, it would be asked, maybe, maybe there's a, a little bit of a two-part question here. I think it would be worth asking about the title, uh, you know, uh, you know, Christian worldview. Uh, of course, for us, this is a this is a term that we, we see thrown about in a bunch of contexts. You know, we think of like the worldview movement or worldview education or you know worldview curriculum and all that sort of thing. And Brown Muller. Yeah, like yeah, and it <laughs> right. might be worth you know talking about how what's going on with the world worldview here and how does yeah. it how does it relate to our usage of it. Uh, but then I think you know you know rel you know, related to that, it might be worth asking. Uh, it, interestingly, the book, he kind of starts out uh, interpreting modernity. He, he sort of starts the book saying, like, nobody's really come up. You know, we, we know that we're all in the midst of this kind of massive sea change in civilization, and nobody's kind of come up with the one label to slap on it. Uh, this is sort of, sort of how he begins the book. And yet then he's arguing on, uh, on the backside of that, this is sort of how he ends the book, is Nevertheless, Christianity uniquely has something to say to precisely this situation that we're in. Uh, and so it might be worth saying again then, like, what's he doing with the, the notion of worldview and how does he see that addressing, uh, I guess you could say, sort of contemporary man's intellectual condition uh, and social yeah. condition? Yeah, yeah I, I, I could say something or record. Do you want to go ahead or? Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, uh, sure. That's a great question there, Joe. And I think to really understand what Bavink is doing with this term worldview, we need to go all the way back in some sense uh, to the upheavals of the French Revolution 
1789, right? So the French Revolution, I think, really showed this attempt to have a holistic kind of unbelief, right? And this was really、uh, massive for the Kuyperian imagination. The French Revolution showed that what if we got rid of Christendom and Christianity as a kind of backdrop for Western civilization, and we replace that with the idea of pure reason and equality and fraternity as the foundations of society. So it started to conceive unbelief as not only an philosophical alternative to Christianity, but as well as a civilizational alternative to Christianity.、Mm. And because of this. You know the Enlightenment philosophers and and Schleiermacher and Kant particularly Kuyper had identified them as waking us up as well to the need to justify Christianity in all of the public domains because now、uh, lots of people are beginning to see Christianity as not only philosophically untenable but also pragmatically unnecessary for、mm-hmm. public life and so Kron van Prinster and Abraham Kuyper. They started to therefore argue that if you go with unbelief, the chaos of the French Revolution followed, and the alternative has to be as holistic as what these philosophers and also what the French Revolution were beginning to say. So Kuyper,、uh, I mean, one of the things that he said very interestingly in the Encyclopedia was that he was very thankful in one place he stated for Kant and Schleiermacher because it, they woke us up to our need to argue for Christianity's justification. In every area of life, and also to argue for theology's place within the organism of knowledge, particularly. And Kuyper, as you know, therefore developed this idea of a Christian worldview, and he argued, therefore, that your starting point really mattered, and you can therefore、um, deduce the end point from the starting point. So, if you start with an unbelieving starting point, you're going to end up with an unbelieving end point. And he was very deductive in that kind of way. Now. When Bavin came to the scene, he inherited a lot of these impulses. So even from early on, he wrote a positive review of James Orr's book, *The Christian View of the World*.、Hmm. And you see in *The Future of Calvinism*, *Catholicity of Christianity*, *The Church*, all these Kuyperian impulses came out. But I think in 1904, especially after his move to Amsterdam, the rise of Nietzsche, we can also talk about that. He was more cognizant of how complicated sin is, and so. Yes, he argued that starting points are important, but sometimes the end point isn't easily noticeable from the starting point, if you could put it that way.、Mm. Right. And so he started to envision, therefore,、uh, a Christian worldview project that is more refined than Kuyper's. Maybe we could put it that way, where this was an inductive process that the Christian worldview is not about merely looking at starting points and deducing end points from starting points, but looking at、uh, a patient. Inductive process of seeing how the Christian is given wisdom and patience to look at reality with the arms of, of you know, armed with Scripture, and therefore start to refine their perspective and understand each perspective in that inductive way. So the Christian worldview gives you unique resources to to ha- to to empower you for patient analysis of unbelief. But also to respond to unbelief in very particular ways, and we can talk more about that. There's there's lots、yes. of really arresting passages. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's really really helpful. That's really helpful.、Yes. And maybe that's what we,、uh, maybe that's what we can do. I mean, the book kind of breaks up conveniently into three. I mean, it's 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 essentially an introduction with three sub substantive chapters, and maybe just a you know because this is really I, I, maybe I should I should pause for commercial here, right?、Uh, yeah, uh, right. Uh, This really is a very accessible book. It's deep, and there's a lot of there's a lot of deep theology in it. There's a lot of things that even even you know even people who've been reading theology or philosophy for a long time there's just there's there's formulae in here that are very well put. They're very elegant, you know, distinctive bobbing, but it's very accessible to you know an, or, an ordinary person. And so maybe、uh, maybe working through those sections very briefly will will be helpful to suggest others to read it. Especially if the philosophy of Revelation seems a bit intimidating to you, this is a this is a I, th- I think very accessible. But essentially, so, the the three sections. So, oh, go ahead. Me, Dale. Yeah, yeah, let me ask go, Greg. Go let, first. Yeah. Let me. Well, let me ask Greg because、uh, what he just said was very good. Oh yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Well, we could just like talk about that. <laughs> <laughs>、um, so, 
yes, Bavink is sort of like looking out on the horizon of his context, and he's trying to he's trying to be a good chess player, and he's going, oh, I see these things lining up here in the culture, and these things lining up here in the culture. And Christianity, if it's going to survive these new enemies, is going to have to go here and here and here and sort of dance with the uh, prevailing uh, philosophies of the age in order to show that it's the most beautiful and it's the most true and good, right? Like, so that's what he's doing throughout this book. Um, And that signals to me, just on a meta level, like a certain ethos, and he even talks about this, like a certain character that he's displaying where he's meeting the forces of his current moment with complete and and utter understanding of why somebody would would believe these new sort of interpretations of reality. Given the fact that we've just killed God, just, you know, given the fact that there's a war on the, a, a great war that's coming, given all of the social upheaval, of course, people would be looking for something different. They've always enjoyed a certain level of order. And, you know, uh, but now all the current social sands are shifting. And so Bavink's maturity, I think, uh, is displayed in the fact that he's honestly trying to deal with what he's given. He's not just like moving through it in a sort of like propositional, dogmatic confessional, like, you know, here's the things you need to believe in order to get along with me, but he is really willing to deal with his enemy in a certain way, right? And so just from that perspective, I think that there's a whole bunch of stuff that we could get into, but he does, in the book, that's what he's trying to do. He's trying to lay out like, okay, here's the way I'm going to do that for these people that are consuming this new philosophy. So I'm going to play with their tools and I'm going to show them how their tools are not necessarily the best tools in order to make the thing that they're trying to make. Like they're throwing away the good tools, they're adopting the new thing, and they're trying to develop this new thing that's just not going to work. So two things there, like maybe you could say something about the character of the man and how that can be, how that should imprint on the modern person if we're going to be Bob Inkish. Uh, and number two, like, well, move into the beginning of his argument like what's the first move that he makes in the book yeah Corey disappeared i was gonna appeal to his authority there but that's that's a great question dale um so i I would say that something about bobbing's character i mean this really comes out in bobbing's biography by james eglinton right i mean he he had always been an ironic kind of figure even as a student he had never been attracted to what you might call a proto TR movement in, in, in what you might see in comp and at the time of his secession. So even within the seceder tradition, there was diversity. There are seceders who said, you know, modernity is kind of something that we don't want to engage with. That's, that's behind us now. We just want to focus on our own ecclesial tradition. And then there are those seceders, uh, like you get in the preacher and Donner in Leiden that Bobbing was very attracted to. And Adrian Stecketty, who was one of the professors at the theological school at Compton, who wanted to engage in modernity, who really wanted to be sympathetic. And you also see this in Bavink's friendship with Christian Snau Kogronje, right? Who argued that, I mean, they, they both argue with one another, right? And, and he continually wanted to understand his friend who was very ambivalent towards religion and lived this dualistic Christian yeah. Muslim life or secular Muslim life, right? So I, I think that Arenicism really came out in Bavink's life and, and we really see that in the biography. And um, so I think you know, when he started to describe what it looked like to go to your second question, to develop a Christian worldview, you saw this in, in roughly pages 41 to 55 in this text, where he says that to develop a Christian worldview, you actually start with sense perception. Yeah. Which immediately people are like, okay, I thought worldview, that sounds like an intellectual thing, but now he's starting with sense perception. And then from sense perception, from the phenomena, you trace it back to uh, its first principles. And so you start to see the different first principles of every domain. And then you actually start to see that the first principles of every domain have a kind of unity, mm. namely the wisdom and the ideas within God himself. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and that's the unity that you see there. So you, you, you actually start with what you might call a proximate starting point. 
And then you trace back the empirical phenomena to this ultimate ontological foundation, namely within God himself. And that's the kind of, that process requires wisdom, he argues. So I think in contrast to maybe some contemporary ways of pitting wisdom against worldview, he yeah. says that you have to start with empirical phenomena, follow wisdom to trace it back to the unity of first principles, and then you see the unity of the whole, and that's the Christian worldview. So you can't develop worldview without wisdom. And again, that patience that you see in his life, you see it right. born out in the method of this book too. Corey, you want to add to that? Just yeah. in your, oh, sorry, you go ahead first, Corey, and then I'll, I'll say something. Well, yeah, I, I was just going to say, he also associates that with the path of human life itself from the time mm -hmm. of birth onward. So uh, in the path of human life, you see the development of worldview in that when a baby is born, uh, the process of the development of self-consciousness begins to arise. You know, the baby becomes dependent on mom and then baby is a scientist. You know, they, they start to uh, inductively approach the world and make judgments and, and words come together and sentences and paragraphs and beyond. And then from there, then the domain of wisdom breaches in, which is the domain of, of philosophy for philosophy for him, like Gray was pointing out where you start to seek the whole and the parts which which leads you right. to religion and it's it's an inverted development because um you move from self-consciousness to the first principles but then when you reach first principles then you move back down again yeah and so i think one of the ways that i've found it helpful to define bobbing's definition of worldview he never he never explicitly defines it in any uh extremely concrete way but is to say that for him uh, worldview begins to occur when one allows religion to bear upon the domains of science and philosophy and mm -hmm. life, uh, the, mm -hmm. the everyday life. But that's that's a it's a process of development and it, it, yeah. it's inverted. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It sounds like what you're describing, if I were to try to map that over against some contemporary usage is that the, the way you're describing that sounds like worldview to some extent is an achievement. It's something you arrive at through a process, whereas sometimes, and, and again, the word can be loosely thrown about and used in different ways by the same person even, but at least sometimes it's used in our context almost like a, it's more like a starting point. In other words, when I talk about the worldview you need or don't need, it's sort of like, this is the thing you need to sort of put on at the at the beginning in order to understand anything in the first place, uh, right. in order to, to grasp any, you know, accurate knowledge in the first place. Uh, and it yeah. sounds like it's more, a, it's a retroactively working thing in some ways. Like there's some element of knowledge, which is just the kid bumping into chairs and learning what doors are, uh, you know, right. and then, and then, and then worldview is this high achievement of the human. Uh, but then th that reinforms the whole, if, if I'm understanding. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, that, so, and that's why we've said that, that for Bobbing, a better analogy is that a worldview is a map, not right. a set of lenses, right? And those right. are two different, yes. maybe metaphors for approaching the two different yeah. ways of understanding the worldview. And I wonder if even Bovink is like pulling from Calvin with the reciprocal nature that Calvin lays out in the first book, which is like, you know, in order to know yourself, you've got to know God. In order to know God, you've got to know yourself. And there's this sort of like reciprocal nature between knowledge and growth and wisdom and all that stuff. Well, that's precisely the point in, in some ways, because what a worldview is, is it, it's a, uh, a wrestling. The development of a worldview is a wrestling of which domain becomes preeminent self world or god so is it mm -hmm. I, I i start with myself i'm born and i know that i'm a self and i have a consciousness and i'm dependent on on things but then i know there's a, an objective world outside of me which came first which is preeminent and yeah, that's right. that development leads to religion uh that self-consciousness gives rise to absolute dependence like both calvin and schleiermacher taught us and uh, so that, that's exactly, that's precisely how Bob Inc. thinks about it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Can I, well, can I add? To, oh, go ahead. To, oh, oh, no, go ahead, Gray, go ahead. Just, just really quickly. And I think, um, you know, the, the term worldview, like you all mentioned, is such a diverse concept. People use it in so many different ways. And I think one of the things that I was interested to do in my work as well is to, to show that the term worldview is used by the German idealists in a diversity of ways too. I think oftentimes we think about worldview as merely an intellectualistic, subjective, idealist kind of concept. 
right. without realizing that idealism is not a monolithic philosophical tradition. Yeah. And what I discovered throughout my research is that there are actually at least three kinds of idealisms. And um, Hegel is one of the one, one kind. He's kind of unique to himself. He's sui generis in that sense as a Hegelian absolute idealist. Then there's a subjective idealist, which Bobbing would be very critical against, someone like a J.G. Fichte, right? Right. And then here's a, here's a third kind that I think people miss, and this is very much prevalent, but rarely translated today, what we might call the empiricist idealist. And they would be using the term worldview in a more close way to, to Bavink. And, and here, the two figures I had in mind is Friedrich von Trendelenburg on yes. one hand, and Eduard von Hartmann on the other hand. And mm. the way that they use the term organic and worldview and idealism is, is more closely tethered to what, what Bavink would, would see as attractive within the idealist tradition. And both Trendelenburg and von Hartmann said, the idea or the unity, the unconscious, the, this absolutes that the idealist wants, you have to start with sense perception to discern it. Yeah. Mm. So, 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 and I think, I think folks miss that when they say, oh, it's just a bad idealist term. Well, what do you mean yeah. by that? Which idealists are we talking about? Well, mm. and, and, and that means it's important to, to just say that it, it's not enough to say that because this is Immanuel Kant's notion originally it's that, wrong that, right that it's wrong right. I and mean, that's right. genetic that genetically does not work right um, and so yeah <laughs> yeah there's yeah. there's innocent there's there's perfectly innocent and maybe even sometimes helpful uses of the term depending on your your discursive context right. uh it, it's nevertheless the case you know well and you guys know this of course like it's in, in in some ways this is this is a helpful redemption of the term i think in some ways to see like this is a, a kind of OG uh, <laughs> instantiation of the of the term in right. Christian intellectual discourse, and it's taken on a life of its own that I think could it, you know this yeah. is a great corrective toward. Right. Maybe maybe very briefly we we're, we're about we're about halfway through here. Uh, it would be worth just you know a, a quick summary. I mean, there's three big sections. You know, there's this the section on um, uh, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna read it thinking and being. And then uh, uh, being and becoming, and then becoming and acting. Roughly, it seems like the three pieces of you know traditional philosophy in some ways are, right. are, 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 are sort of involved there. But he's starting out, of course, with this notion of thinking and being. And I think if if if, if I'm uh, maybe I could I can gesture toward it this way that uh, uh, he's trying to he's trying to argue that in a way against the skeptical move. If I'm understanding, sort of a big part of this chapter is. Is to sort of say that um, uh, you 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 need to take something like the adequation between the mind and the world for granted. That that's almost axiomatic. You can never prove it. You can never prove that the mind and the world are, are fitted to each other in the way that they are. Uh, the moment you the moment that actually has a burden of proof on it, you've sort of set up. Uh, getting nowhere. <laughs> right. uh, and yet once you take it for granted, the implications are enormous. Uh, because you have to account for it. Uh, sure, seems like it's true, but you have to account for it once you admit that it's true. So maybe, maybe, uh, maybe that's a, a first underhanded pitch. But maybe talk about uh, what's he what's he pulling apart there in that chapter. Yeah. Well, I have I have things I want to say about this, but I'll defer to Gray first because this is his uh, principal subject matter. So. No. Oh, yes. <laughs> Yeah, I'll also defer to Corey here, but um, definitely. So, <laughs> so uh, 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 that's exactly right, Joe. And I think this is what really distinguishes Bavink from a normal common sense realist, we might say. Because, uh, Joe, you were completely right to say that, you know, we have to take for granted this unity between subject and object, between the self and the world, that you can know the world, right? But yet at the same time, he says exactly what you said. You got to account for that. Why is it that there's such a fit? between the subject and the object. Whereas I think in a common sense realist tradition, they would say, that's just why you don't have to account for it. Just go ahead and, and take that for granted as a starting mm -hmm. point and do philosophy in other realms. Because don't don't talk about epistemology almost, right? Just go ahead and do practical wisdom. That's the way of Thomas Reed, I think. So the fact that he says we got to account for it and it shows that we don't have to be afraid of making a distinction between subjective representations on the one hand and objective reality on the other hand shows that even if you accept that gap between the subject and the object, there are resources within the Christian tradition that can help you link subject and object together. Right. So uh, 
he he doesn't go with the common sense realist route yet at the same time he doesn't go in the skeptical route either of just saying that the gap means that we can't know the object which is what the subjective idealist would want and he points ultimately to the trinity and the creation of of god here as being an organic creation there's a unity between subject and object so he uses this gap as an opportunity to point to the resources of the christian faith rather mm. than saying that this is a means of skepticism and we got to be afraid of it hmm hmm yeah um yeah and i well let me add, add this as well maybe in an insummation is is the way i see this chapter is is him essentially saying that christianity uh because all knowledge depends upon faith as a starting point mm. uh, christianity provides an ontological account that makes sense of a of a of a uh, epistemological certainty that is persistent across all peoples at all times and um this this is what maybe this this maybe this will poke gray a little bit but i don't think so um i think i think we're i think we're in the same place on this but this is what makes uh i think we hope you get into a fight that would be great yeah well <laughs> yeah, <it's>, uh, <laughs> think about the ratings fellas yeah. <laughs> yeah no 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 we're uh i think we're walking hand in hand on this but um yes but uh this is what makes bobbing different than van till i would say on this on this particular point because what Bob Inc. is saying, as far as I understand him, is that because of the universality of epistemological certainty, uh, we need an ontological account of why that is the case. The mm. issue is not actually epistemology, but the justification of common epistemology, of, of a common ability to know. Right. right. Um, uh, and and that's where he and, and as, as far as I see it, Ventil were different on, on this particular point. Yeah. Um, uh, so what is the second? So from there, if he begins there, where does he move into the second part of uh, the book? Like what's he doing? And the second part of the book is um, being and becoming. Yes. Becoming. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And then there's acting. Yeah. Yeah, let me just say, first of all, that I completely agree with what Corey said. So there was no reason for a fight there. Uh, <laughs> yes. Too bad. Next, no, no, next, next time. Yeah. Next time, uh, fellas. Yeah. I've, I've definitely gone to see so many of those differences between Bavink and Van Til, for sure. Uh, and another way to get at the second part there, and to your question there, Dale, is um, that union between metaphysics and epistemology, right? He has got a very holistic understanding of the relationship between the two. Yes. And maybe to to kind of summarize what, what Corey said too in another way is that Bavink appeals to metaphysics to provide an epistemological justification for what we epistemologically take for granted. Right. Yeah. So so uh if if you're if you're cognizant of the um analytic debate about epistemology, there's this debate between externalism and internalism. And externalism is kind of the planting in common sense route, which says that you can have uh, you don't need reasons internal to yourself to believe what you believe. You can simply take it for granted. If there are conditions situationally that makes your beliefs reliably formed, then you don't need to provide an argument or an internal justification for why you believe what you believe. You can just say, I don't know why I believe this, but I'm reliably formed and there's a situation around me that makes my beliefs reliably formed. I don't need to provide an argument for me to be justified in what I believe in. Right. But interestingly, Bavink doesn't go that route. I think he goes in the internalist route where he says, we got to account for this. You got to provide a justification for why it is that we can take so many things for granted. And here's where he goes to the doctrine of creation, the Trinity, the logos and all that organic creation. Right. right. And that's grace. the second. Yeah. And grace, common grace. Exactly. And that's, and that's where fairly, he goes in the second chapter. Go ahead. I was just going to say, that's a fairly traditional move, isn't it? In right. principle, in, a, in our words to say that um, there's a way in which there's, uh, he's he's maybe repeating almost this, uh, if I could put it this way, the non-problematic character of epistemology. So it seems like in classical epistemologies, what we're doing is sort of saying, well, we do know, like we know that we know things. And so let's just maybe say a little bit phenomenologically about what that is. What is this faculty of knowing? But then the real move is to say metaphysically, what is kind of the precondition to account for the fact that this knowledge faculty exists and works the way that it does. 
And it seems right. like there's a, a relatively parallel movement in Bovink. It's sort of like, here we are, here we are knowing. I suppose you could doubt that, but that doesn't work. <laughs> but let's just say that the, the same thing that's in front of our face seems true. Now, how do we account for the fact that, well, this ep epistemic reality is what it is. It is. Uh, and and it went, yeah. metaphysical. Uh, uh, and, and when he brings dogmatics in, into this um, in, in different places, sometimes it'll be uh, the twofold mediation of Christ as mediator of, of creation, mediator of creation on the one hand, in particular to this subject, Christ is upholding, mediating the possibility of, of both subjective consciousness and objective world simultaneously. But then sometimes he appeals to the work of the spirit in the, in the common graces. And this being one in particular, the, the ability to know uh, for, for he and Kuiper both is referred to as mm. one of the significant internal graces as they mm. refer to it sometimes. So. Oh, interesting. Mm. That is interesting. Yeah. The last chapter is particularly interesting, uh, become, becoming an acting. Uh, if you want to say something about section two, please feel free to do so. Uh, but the section on becoming an acting, I find really, really interesting, particularly his philosophy of history you find there. But, uh, but uh, Gray, you gave, a, you gave a lecture on this. Uh, I, I think that a lot of the quotes from your lecture or from this this third section, and one of the things that you identified, and I wonder if you could just sort of repeat what's the context and what's going on when Bobby identifies this. But it turns out we actually have an almost prophetic moment in human writing here, where Bobbing here he is. Uh, I think you said the, the the finishing touches on this were put in 1913 or 14. Is that what we said was the last edition uh, of this? 13. 1913. Uh, but Bobbing is predicting the rise of something sinister in the German spirit. Uh, and that was really, really interesting to read, you know, as a just as a historical document of somebody sort of looking ahead and seeing what's in the water. Uh, can you tell us what the context for his that observation is and uh, and how, how it is that he came to that that observation? That's fascinating. Yeah. Yeah, I think what he's seeing there is fundamentally a rejection of the classical Christian confession of the creator-creature distinction, right, in the German philosophical spirit. So the Germans were beginning to tend toward a kind of panentheism or pantheistic understanding of God and creation. And so when that begins to happen, you're no longer going to be looking for norms within something other than human culture and something other than human beings and human society. Because mm -hmm. once you start to identify God in the world, the question of how it is that to know God is actually located within the world. And, but then the world is a kind of ambiguous and broad sphere. You have to locate it even further than that because you're not just going to say God is identified with the world's simpliciter because the world is tending towards different directions. You have to start grounding the telos of God within the context of one particular people group's history. You see, and this is where it gets pretty sinister because the Germans were starting to argue with their colonial spirits and their colonial endeavors that the German culture, the German nationalistic spirit is that which manifests the Christ of God, right? The spirit mm -hmm. of God himself. And so when they say that we got rid of God as a transcendent norm, they've actually replaced that norm with something within human history. Uh, and not only general human history, but the German human history. They started mm -hmm. to say, therefore, that other people groups are primitive and they're just lacking the progress that the German spirit embodies. Mm -hmm. So with that kind of perspective, therefore, the German culture became the new, uh, quote unquote, idol, you know, quote unquote, theistic foundation from which they would adjudicate other cultures. And, and Bavink yeah. therefore started to see, you know, there was one haunting quote where he says that Christianity is now an Aryan religion. Jesus yeah. is now an Aryan and right. other worldviews and other cultures are primitive. And he, yeah. he, therefore Germany became the manifestation of that spirit of God, right? Which was very dangerous there. And he anticipated therefore, I think things that happened in World War II. Yeah, he, yeah. he in fact, he part of the, the the overall philosophical argument he's making in this chapter is the tendency of relativism to become totalitarian. And that yes. is such a and, he, and, he's, and he, of course, he's, he's reading this off the off the events of his own moment uh, as well. And he's seeing trajectories and in, in, uh, again in Germany. 
but but uh, it, it's interesting to read that text now, pull this open and read it now and think like, you know, this is just this is just enormously this is enormously relevant for our own moment where relativism uh, uh, yes there are certain kinds of relativism. Nevertheless, I think Bob Inc., and this is maybe one this is a, a controversial uh, a door swing here. Um, there's a way in which Bob Inc. is also fighting, on the other hand, a kind of relativism uh, which which manifests in a sort of tribalism within his more conservative communities as well. So that is to say, he's he sees a kind of capacity for totalitarianism of a sort. Maybe it's not a political totalitarianism, but maybe an ecclesiastical totalitarianism that exists similarly within a certain mentality toward sort of like here's our tradition and it was good enough for grandpa and it's good enough for me. And, you know, everything else is kind of reflexively measured by it with no sort of portals for sort of, sort of relation to what's outside of that tradition to, to, to aid it in any way. Uh, is that a, is that a decent, is that a fair reading of another, <coughs> yeah. another angle that he, through which he'll apply this critique of relativism? Well, uh, he, he, he and Kuiper have a very consistent binary uh, that they use to describe exactly what you're describing. And that's conservatism versus orthodoxy. And so they, they choose those two terms uh, to set that distinction that you're describing. Sometimes they'll say dead conservatism, living orthodoxy, and that they were constantly as people, you know, both Kuiper and Bobby were together trying to unite uh, a church in 18 in the 1890s in the Netherlands a free church that there were multiple branches of together. And that's one place that that was most manifest where, where they were describing the difference between what, what you describe as dead conservatism versus living orthodoxy. Mm. Uh, and that was right when Bobby was publishing the first edition of the reform dogmatics. And it, it was almost as if he had, he had offered this new church that had just come together. Um, an example of what living orthodoxy looks like in, in the text of the re four volume reform dogmatics. So, yeah, mm. that's, that's right. I, yeah. I wanted to mention as well that um, based off what, what you had said before and what Gray was just saying, he makes a very similar argument as the one we were just discussing with this, this um, critique of the, the German spirit he saw developing in 1916 in the middle of World War I. Um, he writes an essay then called Ethics and Politics. And his big agenda in that is to discuss uh, acting, ethics, uh, how we might seek to ground our claims for the moral order. And he goes after relativism. But his big question in it at the end of the essay that he delivers uh, to some national figures in the Netherlands is, um, when the war is over and we start trying to decide who's going to uh, adjudicate uh, between the nations and who are the criminals and who who who's the guilty parties how how are the nations post Nietzsche going to do that when they have no grounds for anything yeah. that we might call international law like how mm. could you have international law in the midst of relativism mm. right so only the winner gets to decide justice in that scenario and so he wrote a, a whole essay kind of going after that, this same issue again in, in 1916 uh, toward the end of his career. Mm. Uh, That's really so you're right. I think that he was dealing with <clears throat> subjectivism um, in the way that you just talked about, Corey. But like in the third chapter, he goes after it explicitly. And so like what are the movements that he's making in that third part of the book where he's just like showing what the weakness is, and then he's offering the Christian solution and saying, this is where Christianity satisfies all of the philosophical impulses of the individualist and sort of like rep ties it all up in a beautiful bow and says, come to Jesus, right? So like, what, is, what are the movements? Because I think that, um, <clears throat> Gray, what you did there is you, you made a distinction between subjectivism, which is very helpful. So everything is not just all in this realm and all in this realm, we have to actually think. But we're dealing with this right now, 
right? So to sort of bring this all the way down to the ground, if we're talking with people in the pews, if we're talking to our neighbors, when we're talking to our friends and our family, we're, be we're bombarded with CNN and Fox News headlines about all of the horrible things that are developing in the world, all of these horrible philosophies that are finding their way into our political realm. Like, how do we move out and be like, here's what Bovink would do when he's talking to his neighbor about subjectivism. Like, how could we take what Bovink does in that third section and practically manifest that in a, in a real lived way right now? Because I think that's what Bovink was doing. So how, how do we do that? Corey, go ahead, brother. <laughs> <laughs> Solve our um, problem. Yeah. And I understand the and I understand the complex nature of the question. So, you know, we'll forgive you if five years from now you change your mind, but you know, give us give us what you think. Yeah, maybe I, I could I mean I could just maybe get get this get it started with, with this. I know at the, at the beginning of that third chapter, um, the way he gets into the issue of relativism and subjectivism as it relates to moral norms and the moral order and, and the, all the problems that it creates is by, is by doing what the, what the Bible does and doing what Jesus does. And that's appealing to the conscience and saying that mm -hmm. no matter, uh, no matter how much the spirit of Nietzsche or Ernst Renan or, um, or whatever it might be, uh, Hegel, Hegelian materialism that's, that's developed, dominates uh, the early 20th century and no matter how uh, many different systems of, of theosophies or religions start to, to start to develop he, he really here says the weight of the law the weight of the moral order continues to bear down upon our souls and we can't get out from underneath it and we can't get away from the conviction of sin and in some sense, I feel like that's what provokes him the most in, in this chapter to address relativism and subjectivism is in some sense the problem of the weight of the law, uh, the condemnation of the law. Uh, mm -hmm. So there, there's a very biblical starting point here at the beginning of the chapter. He doesn't uh, make much mention of scripture here, but he, he, in the first few pages, says that as soon as we awaken to consciousness, we discover the laws and norms above us that direct us in order to elevate us above nature and force us to release from its coercions. And then he goes on the to the next page and talks about the heaviness of its weight that we know we break it. So, I mean, it's quite pastoral here at the very beginning of, of this mm -hmm. chapter, which is a very philosophical chapter. Um, that was me trying to skirt around your question because I didn't have a good answer. So um, yes, I understand, Gray, brother. Maybe no worries. Gray can, but Gray, maybe obviously, Gray, will, Gray yeah. will obviously he'll, he'll, he'll take us out. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I mean, I completely agree with what you said there, Corey. I, I think what, what you have in Bobbing, if you were going to speak just pastorally to the guy on the ground, um, I think he would point out, for example, we, we could point out that there is a kind of rationalist, irrationalist dialectic as a result of relativism, right? Because at the same time, you see in the culture a kind of scientism where they say, well, I can't believe it unless I could see it or it's completely rational to me. But then when you show to them that you can't actually ground lots of what you take for granted on that principle of empiricism, on that principle of scientism, they oftentimes go to emotivism, right? What Alistair McIntyre called emotivism, that ultimately moral claims, normative claims is reducible to feelings. And um, so we can, we can simply point that out to folks, you know, uh, okay, you just told me that you want to know everything by science and reason, yet at the same time, look at all these things that we can't ground from science and reason. And now you have to appeal to the heart. But the ironic thing is when you, when you appeal to the heart, Yes. You have no resources to um, actually understand the other person because when the other person disagrees with you, all you can be doing is just be surprised. Huh? I feel this way. It's so powerful to me. How dare you see? You know, and this is the outrage machine. I think that we yeah. get in social media because we lack resources for public moral discourse now because all people are doing is being shocked that people don't share their feelings, right? Yeah. Which is where yeah. relativism becomes really tyranny. Because now we just denounce the other person because they don't share the same feelings that we do, not realizing that our feelings really are to be normed by something outside of us. And that's where yeah. we need to recover. Yeah, yeah. I, I thought of one more thing while you're saying that. And that's that if you go back to the beginning of the book, he says that what provokes 
him to write this book is the provocation that's occurred of the of the human self in the contemporary age that feels this internal discord that's consumed right. one and and that discord as he puts it at other places is one between the head and the heart yes. and, and he said that what what we need is religion and answers that uh, meet the needs of both the intellect and the heart to bring them together into organic unity. And the, yeah. the, go- the gospel is actually the unifying agent, right? That satisfies the needs of intellect and heart that brings the self together in organic harmony that pushes back against the privation of sin, which is the dissolution of the self and, and Bobbing's very Augustinian understanding of yeah. sin. And I, one, one thing, this is the last thing I'll say. And, and one thing I wanted to mention is, I think it's really beautiful in the introduction and uh, how he talks about his project in terms of the metaphor of Jesus's trial at the end of the introduction. And mm-hmm. I think it relates to some of these pastoral things we're talking about. He says that just as when Jesus Christ came out of the Roman tribunal after being tried by Pilate, and we said, the human said, away with him away with Christ, we want Barabbas, Uh, that moment showed exactly how much the world needed him. It was our our rejection of him that showed how much the world needs him. Yeah. And he said, it's in the same, the same, we we are in a similar moment, he said in the 20th century, it is in the rejection of Christianity that Christianity then proves itself so essential because without it, the head and the heart can never be unified. Yeah. And, you know, and that means that there's, there's a pastoral concern that really drives this book as philosophical as its orientation may be. Yeah. And I think he's calling the everyday Christian up, like he's calling them to the moment. Um, and of course, this is before the post postmodern age that we're in, uh, which is just, you know, full of um, just frankly, a, a bunch of illiterate people that are yeah. not familiar with history and, and with the classics. And really what Bovink is doing is just advocating for a classical understanding of the human, a totally formed, perfectly organized, properly ordered, passioned man um, th- that understands the world in a holistic way. That's what he's saying. Like when you unify the head and the heart, that is the Christian worldview. You inevitably end up there because this is the best explanation, no matter what a philosophical or scientific argument you make, you will end in Christianity. <laughs> Anything else, Gray, before we close out, brother, any other uh, little caps you want to put on the conversation or are you happy with where it's at? Very happy to where it's at. Let's go ahead and advocate for living orthodoxy rather than that conservatism then. Amen, brother. Well, Amen. we 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 lost Joe in the in the uh, at the end here, but uh, he'll be back next week, Lord willing. Um, Corey Gray, thank you so much. Uh, we we appreciate your work. We're advocating for your work. We want to see you guys do more work. So keep up the good work, and uh, hopefully we'll talk soon. Thanks, Dale. Thank you, Dale. All right, brothers. <laughs>